Hi everybody. What we're going to talk about in this section is bilingualism. So be sure you've noticed we've skipped chapter four um, and we're really moving into the more nitty gritty of multiple languages as well as um, uh, perception of language. And so the next section is going to be really pretty long instead of going to cover word recognition, but it's kind of a couple of big chunks um, and different pieces to word recognition. So first in this section, we're going to cover multiple languages in one brain. So the difference between bilingualism, which is what most people study, and multilingualism is just the number of languages that you know. So bilingualism is speaking two languages fluently, whereas multi is speaking three or more languages fluently. A lot of these theories are based on bilingualism because um, access to multilingual folks is um, not the easiest in the United States, for sure, um, and difficult to control in countries like Europe, where they might speak three different languages, and if you were trying to, say, only find people that spoke English, German, and French, you know, you would have a hard time. So, most of these series are based on bilingualism, although with uh, culture and society, we are getting more research on multilingual folks. So, the first thing we have to really define is fluency. So fluency is the ability to understand and speak the language. And so there's kind of two pieces to it. And it becomes important because it defines how we understand folks who are fully bilingual and then what most of us consider as a sort of working bilingual. Um, so let's talk about that a little more. There's productivity. So productive bilinguals can speak and understand both languages. So you could have a conversation with someone. Receptive bilinguals understand the language but can't produce it. So this is when you're listening to, um, you have, you know, you took four years of Spanish and you can understand what people are saying around you but you can't really talk back to them very well. That would make you receptive to the language but not productive in the language. So receptive is just the ability to take it in whereas productive is the ability to spit back out. Fluency is the ability to do both. So you are both receptive in the language and productive. Um, and this is mostly limited to, to talking about speaking um, because our writing and spelling are sort of separate issues. We've already talked about how language is sort of innate and speaking or understanding the languages can be innate, but writing and reading are two very different things. So we'll cover reading um, in a much later section. So a little bit of definitions. L1 is the language that's learned first. L2 is the language that's learned second. Um, we can have simultaneous L1, L2 acquisition. So um, when they're learned together at the same time. We have what's called early sequential, where you have L1 learned first and L2 is learned relatively early in childhood. Um, and this often happens to bilingual parents, these first two. Um, or um, uh, early start programs for language learning. Late sequential is more of your normal college age kid, high school, where you've learned L1 and L2 is learned much later in adolescence and onwards. Okay, it's much better if you could do the first two, although a lot of us are kind of stuck here in the latter half. Okay. So if I have two languages or more in my brain, which one do I speak? So if I'm fully fluent in two or more languages, what, lang what determines which one's being spoken or written? Um, that is dependent on culture. Um, and so for this section, I, what I really think about is um, countries where uh, multilingualism is more normal than the United States. So think about like Europe, where, um, you know, if you drive for four or five hours, you can be in six different countries where people have their, their native language, so in Germany that would be German, but they also usually speak English uh, because it's taught fairly early in schools. So which one do they speak? Well, that depends on the culture. So many cultures um, speaking the native language first is always preferred. Um, it depends on who you're talking to. So if you're at work and you work at a place where there's constant tourism, you might start with English just because you expect that to be a language that you both have in common. Um, but if you're speaking to your parents, you're going to switch back to the native language. It also depends on the national language. So there are countries with more than one national language. 
uh, but there's well, usually one that's preferred, and so people will speak in that one first. So that, the, the language that, that's being produced really just depends on a lot of cultural issues um, and some pragmatical issues. So some questions that we have when we're thinking about bilingualism and language in general is what's the best way to teach that second language? And there's a ton of research on second language learning um, and the ways that maybe we can improve second language learning so that we have a more uh, multilingual society. Uh, but then once that happens, how are those languages stored in the mental lexicon? So once you have those two or more languages, where are they in the brain? How does that work? And how's it different than a monolingual person? And how do we translate back and forth between languages? Um, so if you're trying to learn a second language right now, say you're taking Spanish 201 or something, um, translation becomes that sort of interesting problem because you wish you didn't have to translate and it came to you more naturally. So some early research on these kinds of questions looked at people, and it was more qualitative. So um, they looked at people who sort of moved countries as children and picked up and switched to new languages. So lots of um, uh, people in Europe, but also army brats or military kids. So um, people that uh, moved to a different country and learned the new language. Uh, and that were their descriptions of how they learned and how that worked. Um, they looked at people who they look at people who language mix. So it's when you are speaking one language, but then you add the suffix from another. And specifically, code switching. So code switching is when you're speaking one language and you switch to the other one mid sentence. And so you'll hear this a lot in areas where there's a predominant second language. So here in New Jersey, Spanish is very popular. Um, and, but there are some words that just don't have a translation. So you'll be sitting there and you'll be listening to people speak in a different language and then they'll say a word in English. And so it's sort of like, wait, what just happened? Um, so when they say Newark, for instance, um, that doesn't have a, it's just the name of town. So they just say Newark. And so there's this weird pause and then that goes back to being Spanish. So code switching to me is really interesting on how people um, understand that I've switched languages, but continue to understand meaning in uh, in the sentence, even though we've switched between languages. Um, and the early research supported that languages are, are learned well, especially if you are simultaneous or early sequential learning, but there's slower vocabulary development in each individual language. So it actually for a while looked like it was harmful for you to learn a second language early in childhood. Um, because you, it looked like you didn't weren't learning vocabulary as quickly as a single language learner. Uh, but that's been quickly debunked and it's actually much better for you. You are learning two individual voca lexicons and so your overall lexicon is much larger than a, a single language person. Um, it's just individually in each lexicon is a little smaller at the beginning because you are still learning. Um, but in general, it's overall being bi or multilingual is a great linguistic advantage. Um, it gives you metalinguistic awareness, so your understanding of language is better, more cognitive flexibility, so more your general cognition, and then more verbal fluency because you um, understand more of the rules. So it's a good thing to be bilingual, so keep trucking at it. So let's talk about the lexicon. So there are several hypotheses for how the lexicon is stored if you know more than one language. Um, there's the separate store model, which is that there are two totally different separate lexicons, one for each language, and they have connections to each other at the semantic level. So remember that semantics is meaning. So it's kind of like having two separate dictionaries and the dictionaries happen to have the same definitions on the same pages. So you can kind of look back and forth between them, but they're two separate books. There is some support for this model. There's some support for all the models. So we're not totally sure which one's correct, but um, you do see repetition priming in the same language. So what happens is they will, they will say words to you and you say, yes or no, it's a word. Um, and so if you hear the word doctor in English, you're factor, faster at recognizing the word doctor if you hear it again, also in English. Um, if you hear the word doctor in English and then the word doctor in Spanish, you're not quite as quick as doctor in Spanish as you are in English. 
if they were all stored together in one giant lexicon and we didn't have to flip between dictionaries, it wouldn't matter which language it was in, but it does. So that implies that they're stored separately because we, it improves one language but does not improve the other language. So that's the key here, is that that priming improves one over the other. If they were all stored together, it would improve both. Uh, a second model is a common store model where you have one giant lexicon and one giant semantic memory system and the words are just tied together. Um, and so it's kind of like the word for cat uh, or the concept, the abstract symbol for cat has multiple entries, one in English, one in Spanish. Uh, and there is some support for this model as well because you do see priming across the languages um, but not repetition priming in the same way. So if we force priming to be automatic, so um, the way we do that is we show people the words we're priming them with very quickly, so fast you don't even often know what the word actually was. It's just super quick, or we mask it, meaning we show it to you and then we cover it up really quick. So for very fast automatic priming, what we see is that the get language, you get priming across both languages. If we leave the priming as sort of slow, controlled, um, like the first uh, task that I explained to you, priming actually slows down the second language. And so it appears that um, maybe there's more links between the two dictionaries than we previously thought because it depends on what type of process is working on the dictionary and not necessarily the way the lexicon is stored. So research tends to favor that common store model, except, there's always an except, um, there is an interaction with age of learning for the second language. If you are learning simultaneously or early sequential, there's more support for the common store model where everything's all put together. If you are learning later in life, it appears that it's more support for the separate store model where there are separate things. And this sort of makes sense. If I'm learning later in life, I already have my English dictionary and I'm very reliant on it. And then if you add that second language dictionary, I'm sort of going to be slow to read it. But if I'm learning them at the same time, it almost appears as if for a while, the learner doesn't understand the difference between the dictionaries. It's one giant dictionary. Oh, this is English and this is Spanish. Oh, I need to sort this out. So you'll see that kids can understand that the languages are different, but they make mistakes between languages. Um, and so that supports this idea that it's one giant dictionary to them and they slowly kind of sort it out in a common store and get it sort of categorized. Whereas if I'm a later L2 learner, they're, they're very much separate things. And so that leads for a mixed store model. And mixed store models are for <clears throat> sort of people who are fully fluent and don't quite show that it's separate, they don't quite show that it's together, so maybe something in the middle, right? So this is the combination model. And one thing you'll see throughout this, especially the next section, is that this is really popular. You'll have one theory that supports one argument and one theory that supports the other argument, and then somebody will propose something in the middle. Um, and those things in the middle often tend to be the most well-supported because they explain both sides of the argument. But it often does feel like cheating when somebody says, well, maybe it's both models. So um, just kind of a warning, there's lots of things that it's a, maybe it's both models. Okay. Mixed word models are really supported by what are called cognates. And so those are words in different languages that have the same root, um, or they literally have the same word. So oblige in English and French, it's the same word. Um, there are plenty of instances of this between English, French, Spanish, and Italian, where we have a lot of the same um, words for things, or the words are very similar. Um, <clears throat> so one of my favorite things that we have in Germany was Zuckerwaffeln, which are sugar waffles. Um, and those come from a very similar root to uh, English, or well, English stole it from German, which is a whole different story. But um, the idea that those were similar enough, so the words, even though they were different words, it developed from the same root that I could figure out what it was. Those are cognates. Okay? And those words especially appear that they're stored the same. And so one thing about our brain is that we really don't like to think very hard. 
And so if I can say, you know what, this language, this word is the same in both languages. I don't need to store it here and here. I'm just going to store it here in the middle. It's the same word moving on. That's what it looks like your brain is doing. One problem with all this research on understanding the lexicon in multilingual folks is that um, it's difficult to study low level effects if we're really focusing on semantics. So when we're studying the lexicon, we're interested in the meaning, the dictionaries, right? Um, but the way that people filter between languages appears to be a more perceptual level. Um, so perceptual being seeing or hearing. And so it's difficult to interpret a semantic effect, something about meaning, when the results are happening at a speed that's clearly perceptual. Um, and this will make a lot more sense when we get into word recognition in the next section, but there's clearly processes that are quick, those are, tend to be perceptual, and then processes that are a little bit slower, and by slow I mean 400 milliseconds, so we're still talking really quick here, and that's the semantic level. And so if the most of the action is happening at, semantic, at the perceptual level, but we're studying semantics, it's almost happening too fast for us to really claim that it's a semantic effect. It, there is not a lot of research on syntax. Um, some of the research supports that if you uh, have syntax that's roughly similar, English and Spanish, pretty, pretty, pretty similar, adjective placement is a little different, um, and direct objects, I think, but word order is still important. You tend to store that as one giant syntax, um, but the jury is still kind of out on this one. So what happens when we're switching from language to language? Um, and this is when we're trying to translate. So there's a thing called forward translation. I'm going from L1 to L2. Okay. And that requires some form of what's called conceptual mediation. So conceptual mediation is where I have the word in L1 and I have to figure out the meaning of that word and then access that in L2 to translate it to L2. So if I know I have cat, I have to think about what does cat mean and then find that meaning in the L2 dictionary and then translate. Backwards translation, so from L2 to L1, is more of a word association. So we don't go to the semantic level, the meanings of the words. Instead, there's just sort of this direct link. So backwards translation tends to be much quicker um, because we're not taking this extra meaning step. So there are lots of semantic factors that change your performance for forward uh, translation, but doesn't help backwards translation, which is how we, why we think that's those are the way they are, is because so research has shown that there's lots of different dictionary things, I'm um, sorry, semantic things, meaning-based things that change your performance. Um, if you are showing people pictures, so I'm showing you a picture of a cat and asking you to do it in English, and showing you a picture of a cat asking you to do it in French. If you have congruent pictures, meaning kind of matching, not perfectly the same, but matching, that helps you with backwards translation. Um, so there is some semantic involvement, and so, I, Again, it's, it's kind of clear that forward translation requires the most access to semantics, um, whereas backwards translation is more of a just straight word association, so you're not necessarily thinking about the meaning of the word, but there is some evidence that meaning is involved in both ends. So if I am speaking in a target language that could be L1 or L2, um, only the target language is considered. So if I show you pictures with L2 word labels and ask you to name the items in the picture, that other language doesn't interfere. Okay, so the way to explain this is think about the Stroop task. The Stroop task is when I show you words that are colored, like this picture down here, and ask you to name the color of the word. And because of the word superiority effect or the word reading effect, what you see is that people have a hard time not reading the words. But you don't see that between L1 and L2. So if I show you a picture of a cat and it's got a French label for cat at the bottom, but I say tell it to me in English, that French label doesn't interfere. So um, it sort of implies that the other dictionary is turned off when you're trying to speak in the target language. So a little bit of brain. So we've talked about kind of the conceptual idea of where 
this switching occurs and how it occurs in different dictionaries and the semantics related between the two, but where does that happen actually in the brain? So your dominant language, which is considered L1, that's either the one learned first, or if you're doing simultaneous, the one that's dominant, the one you speak more often, usually appears in your left hemisphere in Wernicke's and Broca's. Uh, and L2 actually appears to activate the right hemisphere along with the left. So it's not at the expense of the left, it's with the left hemisphere. So uh, generally your L1 doesn't activate the right at all, unless you're left-handed and then all bets are off. Um, but L2 tends to activate the left and the right. Uh, and remember that we said that we think semantics are stored on the right. So what's happening is we're activating the language part of our brain and the semantic part of our brain. I came in here so you would leave me alone. All right. <clears throat> For children, what happens is the dominant language tends to lateralize. Remember, lateral lateralization is where we... Um, have uh, pieces going only left or only right um, before your non-dominant language. So you tend to see it being only left but first. Um, even if you are perfectly fluent in both languages, you too still tend to see this L2 right hemispheric activation, but it does tend to decrease with fluency. So here's some examples. Um, so this is from an fMRI. Uh, and they've just drawn it on the brain. So here is the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. So in their native language, look, it's Broca's and Wernicke's and the um, auditory cortex and the articulate fasciculus, the connection between the two, very little on the right. English, their second language, is where we get more activation, um, on but on both sides. So now you see Broca's and Wernicke's um, and the connection between the two, the thing I can't pronounce. You also get some activation in the back where they're imagining, they're um, uh, visualizing what it looks like to so your occipital lobe, um, but more activity in the areas of the brain that we would expect to have dictionary stored. So let's talk about acquisition, but acquisition versus learning. And so, and a little bit on why it's so difficult. So why is acquiring a second language so hard? Um, we've talked about critical periods in the last chapter. And so it's difficult to learn um, some of our language parts and uh, especially syntax outside of that critical period. Now, rote memorization is something we can do most of our lives, so we can learn the words but learning the way the words go together and that sort of natural fluency and understanding idioms is a much more difficult. Um, we tend to have less time and motivation as, an, as adults. Um, there's something called the contrastive, hypo contrastive hypothesis, um, which is this idea that if L1 and L2 don't match, it's actually much harder. Um, there's sort of this uh, idea in psychology that like it's easier to learn L2 if it doesn't match L1 so you don't get any interference, but that's actually not true. It's sometimes easier to learn L2 when it matches L1 because then you can map them together and say, well, this is, this is close to my native language and here are the things that are similar so I don't have to learn those again, I can learn just the first thing. Um, what you see is that learning happens a lot at first and then it sort of slowly tapers off and then a big learning curve later when you start to, f to understand what's happening. So you're kind of restructuring your understanding of the language in a way that maps them together a little better. So that forward and backwards translation is a little easier for you. Um, so we started this lecture talking about how do we teach this? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, there are different ideas of different ways to do this. And there are some that are well supported and some that are not. So the traditional method is the translation sort of method where you're translating from one language to another uh, and the lectures and the learning is in the primary language. That is not well supported. It is difficult for people to learn this way because uh, it forces you to focus on rote memorization skills and learning rather than acquisition skills. Okay. Direct methods where the uh, all the teaching is in the second language, which emphasizes really conversation. And that's more well supported, although people don't tend to like it because it's, it's difficult, the learning curve is steep at the beginning. 
he's going to learn a lot of stuff. Okay. So uh, a funny kind of political cartoon about this, and um, which uh, really supports this idea about bilingual education is so crucially important, and especially in the U.S., we're not doing a very good job at it, um, even for languages that many, many people speak. So a couple of different teaching um, ways, and this is more of the direct method. Um, so autolingual methods emphasize speaking and listening before reading and writing. There's things like Rosetta Stone and Duolingo. Um, that really focuses on getting you to speak and to listen to the language before really spelling and grammar. Immersion is where the teacher um, teaches learners exclusively in L2. That's correct, but it looks funny. Um, this is where you're really only listening to L2. And submersion is sort of like a submarine that just get tossed in. Everybody's speaking L2 and you pretty much are going to learn the language or you're not. So that would be like going overseas. Um, immersion is where your classes are only uh, in L2. Submersion is where everything is in L2. Okay, they're very similar. Um, so let's talk about the difference between learning and acquisition. Learning really focuses on explicit grammar rules. The noun goes here, the verb goes here, this is how you conjugate the word, these are what the words are. Whereas acquisition is where you're unconsciously learning the grammar rules. Um, and so it's sort of uh, relying on our, our understanding of, of natural understanding of language and we sort of unconsciously see that the noun always starts at the beginning because you're listening to it so much. Um, programs that are more effective focus on acquisition over learning. Okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> so back to acquisition and learning. So children usually tend to acquire that first language unconsciously so we don't learn it. It's sort of automatic. Uh, and this is sort of Chomsky hypothesis. Whereas um, as adults, we're really forced more into learning because it's difficult to do that unconscious, um, unconscious learning or unconscious acquisition rather. Um, but we tend to focus on learning. So I'm gonna learn all these words and I'm gonna, then I'm just gonna figure out how to put them together. But we really should be focusing instead on acquisition. Um, you do see this sort of natural order in acquisition. So uh, there's like a, a way that almost every language follows. So you'll see that children make syntax errors followed by generalization rules. So that's when you try to say goad. Come on, you little brat. Um, and it, whatever uh, languages you're learning, you get the same order of these issues with language. And if you are acquiring a second language, so this is acquisition, and uh, you tend to see the same order of problems. So even as an adult, if I was trying to learn French, I would make the same mistakes in the same order that children learn, do when they're learning. Um, because there's sort of this natural procession to acquisition. So there's this idea of what's called the monitor hypothesis in the sense that we monitor our process and our progress in learning, much like a, uh, a class would monitor you or like if you're doing Rosetta Stone, it sort of shows you how well you're doing. Um, and so it's the idea that acquisition processes create the sentences in L2. Learning is what enables us to check and make sure the sentences are grammatically correct. So. Um, acquisition helps us with the grammar and creating those sentences, but the learning and the words and all that semantic stuff really enables us to make sure that we're doing it correctly. So monitoring is based on learning, um, creating um, is based on acquisition. So to create comprehensible output or the, the role of comprehension, this is more conversational direct learning where we have to really emphasize the meaning and form of that, that input. Um, and this is part of the monitor model. So um, one of the big things that we focus on is understanding meanings for comprehension. Uh, but there's also this sort of active filter. So when people are speaking to you, the way that they say something, the emphasis, the emotional factor, the body language um, is also really important. And so that changes our comprehension, which will then change the output we respond back with. And so, um, 
it sort of argues that people who are good at this are actively filtering out variations in meaning based on the situational cues. Okay. So some concerns with this idea of monitor model. So the monitor model really, if you want to like sum it all up, is this idea that we acquire grammar and that allows us to make sentences, but then we learn ways to monitor our interaction with people. So we focus on comprehension. They're understanding me, I'm understanding them, and then here are all these other situational cues that I have to pay attention to to um, translate what I'm trying to get to. And we also probably do this in L1, but this is specifically for L2. Um, so there are some other influences on learning, um, not acquisition, but learning. And that is our ability to code those phonetics. So uh, the older we get, the more difficulty we have in hearing phonemes that we do not have in our own language. This is one of the reasons we talked about the LR problem. So people um, who don't speak English naturally sometimes have a difficulty in hearing the difference between our L's and our R's because they're made very similarly in the mouth. Um, so if you can't hear the difference between two phonemes, it's very difficult to code that. Um, and then also grammatical sensitivity. So uh, just cognitive ability wise, we have to um, have the brain power to really be to understand grammatical functions. So yes, I understand prepositions in English just fine, and I could probably get the idea of prepositions in Spanish, but then I also have to realize uh, the function of maybe a, a, um, a gender tagged language. So those, there are more of those words, but I have to remember that the, all these words are the same for the. Um, our ability um, for second language learning, something that the monitor, mon monitor model doesn't totally explain, is our road learning ability. So that's working, that's memory, working memory. So working memory is how many things at once you can hold in your head. Your uh, sort of inductive learning ability. So um, inductive learning is non-conscious learning, so it's automatic, so that's more acquisition. It's our ability to infer rules from data. Some people are just better at it than others. And our motivation. So all of these things on these two slides are things that that monitor model doesn't really explain well when we're talking about people learning and acquiring a second language. So what can we do about uh, second language learning and acquisition? Those immersions direct models seem to work quite well. Um, especially if it is necessary for you to get along <laughs> day to day, but immersion in smaller chunks. So um, just like children have smaller working memories and smaller sort of memory spans and attention spans, that's actually helpful for them because then you're only taking in so many chunks at once. So the chunks are more manageable because they're smaller. And so if we start with smaller units and build up to more complex syntactic pieces, we're going to learn better. Um, so submersion where everything is in L2 can be very frustrating, which decreases motivation, which makes it difficult for learning. But immersion where you're getting things in manageable chunks um, tends to work very well because it's at like sort of your going back to being a kid again, and they're, they're treating you in that way that acquisition is a little easier rather than focusing on le rote learning. Okay. So the other big thing is called the four C's. This is from Sharp um, Communication. So people teaching methods really emphasize using L2 as a communication thing and not just as a rote learning thing. So how do I talk to other people who speak this language? Um, cultural culture focusing on the culture of the language so understanding that english is a really heavily idiom based language can really help um, l2 learners in english but um don't think about direct one 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 to one word translations because those tend to be very funny google jokes and not good translations um and focusing instead on the, the combination of culture and language together 
context, so getting people to understand uh, the pieces around them, the word emphasis, prosody, which removes the sort of uh, rise and fall of words in language, and also confidence. So confidence is a big issue uh, when speaking in a second language, so just knowing that you're saying the right thing um, can help people learn better, so that they have more confidence in the language they're speaking. And that is the end of the bilingualism chapter, and so more of this idea covered in word recognition, and so you'll see more of that, like sort of um, acquisition process of innate word understanding.